This is Kevin Conroy, the voice of Batman. This is Lauren Lester, the voice of Robin and Nightwing. And you're listening to the DCAU Review. Hosted by Cal and Liam. Streaming at DCAUReview.com. And on your favorite podcast app. Gotham City is out of control. An entire city screaming in fear. Super villains walk the streets, preying on the innocent. They will learn the true nature of harm. The police are powerless. A creature prowls this urban wasteland. Is that? He moves in darkness. For some, he is a rumor. A name whispered in the corridors of the underworld, waiting for the chance to strike. Let every criminal know the acid taste of fear. You're crazy! Gotham has forgotten what justice means. The Dark Knight is here to remind them. Batman. Good guys wear black. Welcome, everybody, to episode 287 of the DCAU Review. I'm one of your hosts, Cal, and with me, my good friend, good brother, the man that runs our social media accounts. It's Liam. Liam, welcome to another edition of the podcast. And uh, this one, we are continuing here in our month of Batman the Animated Series reviews. Really, uh, a lot of episodes that we are quite familiar with here as we wind down the original run of Batman the Animated Series episodes. And Today is a unique episode, to say the least, for a number of reasons. We have a lot to talk about with this week's episode, Showdown. That is right, Liam. The episode Showdown, we will get into our review of this episode in just a few minutes. Uh, this episode originally debuted here in the States on Fox Kids block of programming, September the 12th, 1995. Uh, which means we just celebrated the 28-year anniversary of this episode's original airing. And of course, we will f- get our official IMDb synopsis for this week's episode, which is brought to you by, as it always is, by The Pod Tower. Head over to youtube.com slash The Pod Tower today if you are a fan of DC podcasts, DC animation or uh, a combination of the both, uh, we have quite the channel for you with the Pod Tower. It features the entire library of the Tim Talk podcast, which covered every episode of the DCAU from start to finish. It also features our friends at Watchtower Databases podcast, Jump on the Bat Wagon, and it also features our entire library there in one convenient channel for your listening enjoyment, head over to youtube.com slash the pod tower and subscribe today. That's right. So this is the synopsis for showdown, which uh, has a story by Bruce, Tim, Paul Dini and friend of the show, Kevin Altieri also directed by Kevin Altieri uh, teleplay by Joe Lansdale. I should mention uh, music by Todd Haven and animation by Dong Yang. And that synopsis reads as such. While the dynamic duo race to stop Ra's al Ghul from performing a kidnapping, the Wild West story of how he was once opposed by the disfigured bounty hunter Jonah Hex is told. Well, the kidnapping sort of already happens while they're listening to the tale. It's already happened. So it's not like they're racing to stop. I mean, they're kind of racing to stop them from absconding with the person that they yeah, kidnapped but the kidnapping is from, get, from catching their flight is what's, <laughs> uh, what's actually happening but as we mentioned a uh, friend of the show kevin alti we are putting it in here right yes mm-hmm. okay that's that's right we'll have a, a little bit of corrections to make once we get to our plot breakdown but first as you already know if you've read the title of this episode when you could play on it we have a special guest correspondent this week cal as mentioned a uh, good friend of the show, Kevin Altieri. Not only does he get a director credit and a storyboard artist credit uh, on this episode, but he's also credited as a writer on this episode. And uh, while he's not able to join us for the the full episode, we got to uh, to pick his brain 
on very short notice, Kevin was nice enough to make some time and chat about an episode that, as uh, as you'll hear, he is quite proud of. And so uh, I think without any further ado, let's throw it to ourselves in the past and our good friend and special correspondent, Kevin Altieri. All right, everybody. So a very special surprise guest. I, I feel like, Liam, we shouldn't even call him a guest <laughs> anymore because he's on the show so often. He's one of our best friends of the show. Uh, d- director and writer credit. He gets dual credit for this episode that we're reviewing this week. Uh, it is Mr. Kevin Altieri himself. Kevin, welcome back. We're going to get you your own seat on the podcast. <laughs> we're just going to say, hey, whenever you want to show up, feel free to chime in because yeah. uh, we always love having you on. And you know, when we looked ahead at this episode, this is one of those episodes when I don't think we appreciated when we were growing up because, you know, you're watching a Batman cartoon and you're like, who is Jonah Hex? We didn't, you know, when we're, when you're little kids, you don't know who Jonah Hex is and yeah. uh, the lore of the DC behind him. But now as we, as we've grown up and we're watching these through a, a critical lens and trying to analyze them, man, this is, this is one of those episodes that stands out as a very unique part of this original Batman run. And we wanted to have your thoughts because not only does it have Rachel Ghoul, who we've had you on talking about before, and we know is a near and dear character to your heart. Uh, but we know obviously your writer director for this episode. And we really wanted to peel back some of the layers and figure out how this episode came about, how in the world, <laughs> in, in a run of Batman, the animated series, and now the, the uh, network mandated adventures of Batman and Robin run are, did you manage to fit in a, a 22 minute episode featuring very little Batman? You, you did a Cl- Clint Easter. Clint Eastwood Western in the middle of our Batman show. How we pulled actually, that? it's um, it was like yeah, actually, it's the Wild Wild West. Ah, we grew up watching the Wild Wild West reruns, so I'm so <laughs> excited to hear you get it. Reruns, here. not the yes, stupid yes. movie. No, not the yeah. not the stupid movie. We're talking about Robert Conrad in yeah. the original Wild Wild West and with the old steampunk, yeah. these crazy. So tell us a little about before we get ahead, yeah. designs and all that stuff. Uh, well, what do you remember about how this episode came together and like the pitch and all of that stuff? Well, um, it wasn't really a. It was kind of a pitch between Bruce and Paul to me. Mm-hmm. It was. Um, I'm trying to think. I think. I think that it was after the recording for Harley's holiday where, you know, I, I think that was the show, but it was with Paul mm-hmm. it was either that or pa- no, it wasn't deep freeze because deep freeze was after mm-hmm. um, anyway, but I think it was Harley's holiday, but anyway, me, Bruce and Paul are there at the recording studio and we often would all, all pile in the car and just drive over there together. Mm-hmm. And um, so Paul and Bruce go to me and go, Kevin, what because when i when i went to visit dc comics in new york back in the Mm day Mm -hmm. um i had just done in between the seasons i had just done a issue of the demon Mm. so people were very surprised like well if you had your choice why didn't you do batman i'm like well you know i love the demon Mm -hmm. right i I, I always wanted i just wanted to draw the demon i like drawing chain mail i don't know (laughs) no it's like i like the weirder i like the more different comics like i'm a huge fan you know of uh the war comics especially in the 70s Mm -hmm. you know uh russ heath you know alex toth you know all those all the you know the, the the stuff that's outside the box right anyway in the dc universe yep Anyway, uh, so Paul and, and Bruce go, you know, so, okay, Kevin, what character would you want to do in the Batman show? Who would you want to bring in? Mm-hmm. You know, and I said, well, you know, Sergeant Rock, I'd like to do Sergeant Rock or God, Enemy Ace. How would you get Enemy Ace? You know, Neil Adams did that Enemy Ace story, but it really is an Enemy Ace. It's like a guy a descendant of his it's mm-hmm. not actually Hans von Hammer and stuff like that and and I said and I went and said you know and then I went and said Jonah Hex or Jonah Hex I'd love to do Jonah Hex I don't know how we're going to work that in <laughs> and then we started going but if Rachel Ghoul is involved wait a minute yeah this could be a story back then and you know and we have just have to figure out how to, you know so <laughs> we we sat there and and I was saying, yeah, and Rachel Ghoul is doing the master of the world thing, you know, the Jules Verne thing. Mm-hmm. 
yeah. where he's going to take over America because the railroad is screwing up the West. Mm-hmm. And so he's going to, you know, he makes an airship you know, like master of the world. And then he's going to just bomb the hell out of the railroad all the way to Washington, D.C. and take it over. And they're like, wait, yeah. And Paul's like, you know, yeah, wait, you know, we we can. So so we're like hammering, throwing (laughs) on. And that's where the plot came from, you know, the story. That's awesome. I, I, I love the idea that you're just like throwing ideas out there. You start with like, yeah, and then wait a minute, we can put this together. And then, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's a lot of that is what we ended up with. Like that, yeah. that's, that's, that's the tremendous. And, part and, and the plot fell into place. And then between, cause one of the things Bruce was one of the very few people I know that was like a George McDonald Frazier fan. I don't mm-hmm. know if you're familiar with George McDonald Frazier, but he wrote the Flashman books. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and Royal Flash was uh, after the Three and Four Musketeers, Royal Flash, starring mm-hmm. Malcolm McDowell as <laughs> Flashman, you know, with Oliver Reed, you know, with like, you know, Swordsman, mm-hmm. fantastic. You know, it, it's a bit more of a comedy, but I love it. And and Malcolm McDowell was a great Flashman. But Bruce and I um, were fans of the books, mm-hmm. and we would talk about it quite often. Mm-hmm. And that's where, you know, but I don't know who said it first, but it, it was either me or Bruce. It could have been either of us, mm-hmm. but we both agreed. And we went, and Flashman <laughs> is his son. Because Flashman is a son of a bitch, a scoundrel, you know, <laughs> in the books. He's such a, he's such a son of a bitch. But it's like, but he's in, it's the same time period. Like Flashman, you know, so again, that fit in. And uh, from that moment, we were thinking of nothing but Malcolm McDowell for that role. Because right. he had played Flashman, mm-hmm. you know, and he and he could play. He could, you know, it's just you didn't. You hardly had that. You didn't have to give him any direction. Yeah, and I don't. I don't think he had done any animation up to that point. Well, now, the, the, I know this is definitely his first role with with uh, with this this particular universe with Andrea Romano as his voice director. Of course, he would later be Metallo and a few other things yeah. in later shows. But yeah, this is uh, yeah. I think this is very early on in his career and. It is something where I think we've talked about that, how the, the actors who have a great deal of stage uh, experience seem to translate very well to the voice acting as well. And it's oh, just, yeah. it feels like he just picked it up immediately and was. But but of course, the th- thing about Malcolm McDowell is like, oh, oh can, can he do narration? Can he do voiceover? Mm-hmm. All you got to do is watch Clockwork Orange. Mm-hmm. Because yes. He's the narrator. Mm-hmm. You know, and just his he's just he had such a rich voice absolutely but different than david warner so i was gonna you, say but you pair those two together yeah. yeah and just watching them sitting next to each other and talking you know you've grown rather bold arcady <laughs> logging my men you know? i think that adds too to the end when you have mm-hmm. the final twist that this is his son is it's like wow these two dynamic voices because David Warner's is so much more calm it's direct it is sinister but it's very understated whereas Malcolm McDowell is clearly over the top and animated in the way that he more, more of a peacock a, like, absolutely dynamic yeah. in the way that he's so that in in some ways I feel like adds to that twist is holy cow this guy is actually Rachel Gould's son like yeah. that you you didn't see that twist coming and that's why this whole story happens to begin with so. And I, and I think, um, in my opinion, um, I think Arkady Duvall is one of Bruce's best character designs. Mm, incredible. Because it's him doing Flashman out of the book. You know, mm. like, this is, you know, if we're going to do a Flashman cartoon, this is what he would look like. I love that. That's tremendous. Um, so you mentioned, I assume you were pretty familiar. You you grew up reading Jonah Hex Hex comics, like back in the day. That was something you were yeah. pretty familiar with the character. I, yeah. I read someplace there was like a, there was a direction uh, to kind of change a little bit of his characterization. Did you feel like that that worked better for the, not making him like the straight up Confederate soldier, you know, and having a bit of it, well, bit of a different motivation? Well, he is a bounty hunter. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. You know, and um, they allude to it when he goes, when he first shows up in the town, mm-hmm. you know, you allude to it. Oh, and but, but you know, you allude to him being a bounty hunter. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Don't say death. Now, 
and, it, and just to go back a little bit, because like after almost immediately after that we met and I and before the script even happened, because <laughs> because Joe Lansdale and you when you guys were kids, mm-hmm. the reason why you weren't reading Jonah Hex was because it was very adult at this point. Right. It's like DC started doing more adult and Jonah Hex was a real bounty hunter, you know. Right. He, and Joe Lansdale was, uh, I think, writing at the time. Okay. So Paul Dini said, I can get Joe Lansdale. But before the script even was happening, I come back and there's Joe Denton, who was doing, um, I think he was a background guy. I'm not quite sure. But he was certainly capable of doing props. And he was someone who could really ink. You know, he, he was like a guy who inks. But Joe, he was um, older than most of us there you know or well he was older than me and i think i was older than most everyone else anyhow but (laughs) but joe um i went up to joe and i because joe would go off for weekends for entertainment and he'd go to arizona and he'd come back and he'd say hey kevin this is me like last weekend and it's like he was in tombstone arizona and there he is, six guns, you know, bandolier. <laughs> oh my gosh. Or then he would go and he would do like uh, you know, like civil war reenactments, oh, which wow. they, they had they had a bunch of them in California. Wow. So he was like a real cowboy aficionado and he was like as interested in history as me. Mm-hmm. So I go to Joe and it's like, Hey Joe, what do you think of this idea? And he's like, <laughs> Oh man. And before you know it, he's done all these props, Colt Dragoons. You know, I said, you know, yeah, no. Jonah Hex comes from the Civil War. Mm-hmm. It's, it's outlaw Josie Wales. Mm-hmm. You know, that's that's the period. He's outlaw Josie Wales. You know, he's yeah. got, you know, the six shooters, that, mm-hmm. but they're the Colt Dragoons, Black Powder Colt Dragoons. <laughs> you know, and Joe just did the models, you know, that and uh, all the props. The, the that usually wasn't his job wow. and then between the two of us i was saying okay so we're really going to try and figure out how would you make at this time how would you make an airship that actually functions right but it's got to be able to take damage so it's got to be an ironclad mm-hmm. so it's like that civil war technology yep and you know hence you know okay you know, so it's like a cross between the CSS Virginia and the monitor. So it's right. got it's got the monitor, but it's got like the CSS Virginia kind of hull. Mm-hmm. So fire broadsides and it's got a gun deck in it and turrets and yep. and then and then we tried to make it work with one with one gas bag, but then we're like, no, no, no. It's like it's a structure going up and twin twin boom. You know, and all of a sudden it started, uh, the Phoenix started to take shape. So cool. Yeah. The, I mean, the designs and some of the, you, I mean, we mentioned Wild Wild West at the top of the, the show, but like the, so, so much of that show incorporated sort of that, what is now known as the steampunk stuff with like taking modern okay. technology, but retroactively, how would this technology have looked or fit in that era and looking through all of this, we were just commenting like, oh, that's that would be right in a you would see Jim West yeah. absolutely going up against Dr. Loveless in an episode with one of those things like that was <laughs> that was right, right up. I mean, and, some of the designs, you know, this, guns, all that stuff. So fun. Steampunk didn't exist yet. Right. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so we went, OK, perhaps, you know, Joe and I were like working out the idea of the concepts and saying, OK, you know, it's like you got the main gun decks and stuff. And we really based all of that on Civil War technology, you know, mm-hmm. American Civil War. Right. Um, so we based that on that, but uh, it still is he's saying, but, you know, looking forward, Victorian era, it's mm-hmm. like a little bit of like uh, World War One era technology. Mm-hmm. Like that's how advanced he would be at that time. Uh, right, right. He would be at that time. He, he's a step past everyone else always absolutely. hence the gatling the, the the pervasive gatling guns you know i was gonna say that was another yeah, one the hand, crank, crank, yeah, the hand crank gatling gun is a is a was a huge uh you know got a big smile out of both of us for that one yeah and 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 bsp was i i don't even think they knew what to think about this 
I would say there's guns going off, there's bombs going off, there's people getting punched in the face, albeit strategically. <laughs> well, there is. And by the way, I, if you, anyone notice on my episodes, you know, Robin, <laughs> you know, at the very beginning, it's the only ball punch you'll ever see <laughs> in, 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 in any of the Batman shows. It was, it's, it's quite a blatant one. It's quite oh, yeah. a blatant one. I love the shot of the guy of the the guy and his his uh, his eyes get so expressive once you cut away from the punch and his eyes like you know immediately what happened like there's no guessing yeah. there but it's funny why, when we've had you on before and you've mentioned how dirty Robin fights I leaned over to Liam as soon as we saw that I was like there's Ke- Kevin fight. Kevin's mandate of Robin being a dirty fighter right there right to the yeah. balls <laughs> yep. it's like and the fight's over. Right, mm-hmm. the guy's probably better. The guy's probably better off. You know? <laughs> That's all he got was a ball punch. He didn't really get you know knocked out or right, exactly. <laughs> He's just, <laughs> just a little punch over. It. That's right, exactly. So our other question about the story was kind of so when once you decide you're going to work on this episode, is there any resistance do you hear about from the network about hey we're doing an episode that doesn't really focus? I on think that they were just shocked. Uh huh. <laughs> sorry to cut you off like that. Oh, no problem. But it's like I think they were just shut. I I think they were just I, I, what I <laughs> you know because it's like you know and another and it's like I insisted like I did in the storyboard. I actually animated the cannonballs and I put it in the timing, the speed of the cannonball, so you can see them, kind of see them. And Bruce is like, "Are you insane?" <laughs> cannonballs and i'm like actually you can see cannonballs it's Mm. like have you ever seen like you know old school like napoleon or parrot guns firing Mm -hmm. i have Mm. uh you can see that cannonball if you're looking for it you'll see it you know so you know it's like bullets are a little smaller but cannonballs are big enough that you can actually see them right you think about the size (laughs) of these things and they and the Don Yang, um, I mean, the studio that whoever got this is like it was. Um, I recognize certain animators, mm-hmm. and whoever got this, it was like one of those TMS satellite studios. Mm. They're probably based in Korea. I'm not sure. It's like mm-hmm. it's Don Yang, but man, they this this one like the tail end of the sword fight, sword you know saber versus mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Uh, Bowie knife mm-hmm. at the end, man. I could not ask for better. It's got squash and stretch and the character. It's like, and they, and they, I don't even care if they're not on model. It doesn't matter. <laughs> the but, action. Yeah. The action, the action is from that like middle portion. Once the, once the Phoenix gets off the ground, it's, it's like nonstop action for the next like yeah. 10 minutes or whatever it is for it's that third act. act. Oh, and, we, and you guys totally screwed up on the credits at the beginning. What do we mess up? Uh, storyboards oh we uh. missed the storyboard credit oh uh. my goodness <laughs> no i mean i storyboarded like once the phoenix is flying mm-hmm. it's all mm. that's you know storyboard well, wise with well, joe Den and glenn murakami you know but st- still that whole that, that is like, sequence is phenomenal like yeah, it's, it's just, like a, it's just like a dream come true for me to get to do that and it's like of all the episodes you know, I'm perhaps proudest of this one. Wow. Just because it's just so off the normal track. Yes. I mean, you, Absolutely. Didn't see, you, didn't, you never saw anything like this. Exactly. Well, and like you just said, like having to design, think of a vehicle. How how would an airship look that's a little futuristic for the time, but not impossible for the time and that, and that sort of thing and designing yeah. all of that from the ground up? Yeah, of course I can can see by why that one yeah i just love how like even though you wouldn't necessarily i think think of jonah hex as like a swashbuckler in this episode that whole last sequence where he's swinging on the rope and and you know swinging around he's got you know he's has a sword duel at the end like it takes on this almost you know pirate pirate adventure feel in that in that last act even though there's all the explosions and guns and fire going on yeah and then people are saying you couldn't fight you couldn't fight like a saber with a Bowie knife. And I'm like, it was done. Yeah. It what was are you done. Do? You're figure it out. Right. Yeah, it was like, no, the civil war, the American civil war happened all the time. There you go. Bowie yeah. knife basically you just have to have the knowledge to know that it happened. Right. <laughs> but in a band also, it's like, if you go and say that, it's like, well, Jonah Hex certainly 
could fight a saber with a Bowie knife. I was gonna say he's. This is not the first time he's probably done that. <laughs> it's an. Yeah, I was gonna say you. You also went with. You didn't go with the younger incarnation of Jonah Hex at this episode. He's clearly oh. wash. It, like you know, it's the tail end of his of his run. It's established many times. He's done this for a long time. You even get the the lethal weapon line at the end. You know, I'm getting too old for this. Like he gets yeah. you. Know, you get that thrown oh, in and, there. And, so and, it's established. And, he's been around a while. In Bruce's design, where he just decided to make him completely bald, <laughs> <laughs> just have a long hair fringe, uh-huh. you know? and uh, you don't see it until they hoist him up by his ankles and the hat comes off. Yep, absolutely. Uh, speaking of designs, I mean, we we touched on it briefly already, but how fun we've talked we've talked to you before. We've had you on, and we know that you have such a passion for uh, aviation, specifically trying to fit in as many different designs as you can. Spe- specifically, we talked about it on the uh, on the blind is a bat, or not blind is a bat, the um, um, off balance off balance episode oh. with getting the different planes and stuff in for Rachel Gould. Uh, besides, obviously, our main event here, which was a which was an incredible design, but uh, there's a couple of other planes. It seems like you you may have worked in there also, and even Rachel Gould gets his own like little foot powered oh, yeah. glider. Yeah. Well, it's like it's just it's just a glider. It's right. just a glider. Um, but it's like it's based on um, Otto L- Lilienthal, I think is how you pronounce his name. Okay. But it's I mean I looked at yeah I looked at like uh, Otto Lilienthal, and I just thought well suppose you what would you make. Right. Mm-hmm. That whole that whole deck was just an invention by me. That hanger, you know, <laughs> and then how it would work. It's like I enjoyed, like, oh yeah, you'd have guys hauling on chains and mm-hmm. like you know, and uh, and you, you know, and he hands off his hat. You know, right. like, oh, it's all going to blow up. Right. Here, my hat. <laughs> One thing to happen to this, you know, because <laughs> it's just going to get blown off my head once I take off. Uh, so fun and the, and the Leo, Leonardo da Vinci uh, parachutes mm-hmm. there you go absolutely yeah I was gonna say I, I would throughout this whole episode it's like you now that we've talked to you several times I'm like we can see your fingerprints throughout the episode very clearly as like okay we know how much Kevin has a passion for this stuff so I bet you <laughs> he took meticulous time to make sure that this one design went in there worked right flew right in the animation like it was super super neat to see that stuff and there's a lot of it in this particular episode for sure yeah well I, I mean that's uh well yeah, it's like it, that. That one wasn't hard to figure out. <laughs> <laughs> we read, it, and I think, in an interview that you'd given in the past that, uh, and, and you actually mentioned before we started recording that there was uh, a lot of stuff cut from this episode. Was there anything you you previewed, showed us a little one little sequence of a storyboard before we started recording? But was there anything that you wish had been able to be included that was either cut for S well, and P or that would have, you know, that you really were like, ah, oh, I can't believe I got to lose this piece. Well, it's like it, it, it. The weird thing is, is like this was originally going to be um, just like an evening, the evening time slot. Mm-hmm. But it got put on Saturday morning, and mm-hmm. Saturday morning there was like a thirty seconds difference. I think okay. it could have been a minute mm. because there's just uh, more on Saturday morning at the time. There was just an extra commercial or whatever. Gotcha. It was a break. Um, so even though things, were, okay, here's one, things were cut out of the script that I really would have liked to have had. And, um, this one had to have been a BS and P, but in the original Joe Lansdale script, mm-hmm. Owen Hex gets put into his cell, you know, he's captured by Rachel Ghoul and he's in Rachel Ghoul goes and says, well, you know, mm-hmm. you know, lock him up and, you know, anyway, okay. So the guard closes the gate. We, we, t- this was cut out totally. It's like he just gets put into a cell. Mm-hmm. But guard slams the gate and goes, sweet dreams, Hex. And <laughs> Jonah Hex goes, don't mind if I'll be dreaming about your mother, do you? <laughs> that got cut. I don't uh, know why that would have got cut. Yeah, oh, come on. You know, a, a kid would have known what that meant. <laughs> Uh, that's too funny but the, so that that got cut you know but uh there was things like well we had uh patrick Leahy, you know and it's like this and everything kind of fit in the edit before mm-hmm. but 
it's like we had you know our our senator patrick Leahy. it's like the only problem is and andrea got him to mm-hmm. play the governor mm-hmm. and patrick Leahy spoke and did his delivery like and it's not a big it's not a big speech but he spoke like he was actually giving a speech right mm-hmm. <laughs> Oh, it's kind of long. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh, no. It's like, if I got to cut something, I'm going to cut some of the speech. And then I checked, and Andrea said, you can't. Mm-hmm. Why? That's the deal. If we get a public servant like Patrick Leahy, and he's, he's a great supporter of animation, mm-hmm. huge supporter of animation. So if you get his voice, you can't cut any of it. It was just like, that was just kind of the contractual deal. Mm-hmm. You know, to, if you're going to get a senator or a governor who gives you a voice, that's kind of what the deal was. Interesting. So I had to keep him in. And if you notice the scene where he's giving the speech, I have the crowd. I storyboarded this myself. I have the crowd. But to keep the scene alive, I have that kid. I was going to say, that yeah, kid jumping down. up and down. Yep. Trying to see it. <laughs> and then when he finishes his speech, it's like, he doesn't even get to see anything. Right. <laughs> Which also uh, brings, like, this is also another thing. This is, in this particular episode, like, character designers, um, mm-hmm. other than Bruce, came in. Because there's so many characters. There's so many extra characters. Mm-hmm. And you couldn't, and this was, this episode especially, you could not go and just pull from another episode, you know, right. which <laughs> many wouldn't match. Would do. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Although we did pull the horses by Chen Yi Chang. Interesting. Oh. Um, the horses came from Avatar. Okay. Oh, okay. So uh, we were able to reuse that. Yeah, those that, horses. Yeah. I think all we had to do was uh, change change out the saddles and stuff. Okay. But yeah, Chen Yi, um, uh, Mike Diedrich, Dexter Smith. You know, they they really uh, added all those Western characters. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Uh, that really kept it alive, and it, and it has a, and that the result was it really has a bit of a different look. Mm-hmm. It really does, yeah. I mean, that's what makes this episode so unique. It's, it's. St- I mean, let alone just the the time and the the the, the setting of the episode itself, but mm-hmm. all they, the characters are hundred percent unique. That opening scene when we first meet Jonah and he's in the saloon and the everybody's kind of giving him the once over and everyone sees his the side of his face and they all, everyone sort of instantly recoils. I love that. Like it's such a nice little bit of uh, you know just. Showing yeah, like, and telling. That, like. that was Mike Gogan. I gave him all the stuff in the town. <laughs> so fun. And I got to meet, you know, in this one, just going back to like the actors and stuff. Mm-hmm. And speaking of Jonah Hex, you know, Jonah Hex, and and uh, I always thought of Jonah Hex when I was a when I first went to go to the movies and I saw the outlaw Josie Wales. Mm-hmm. Man, it's like I I thought. This is like Clint Eastwood doing Jonah Hex. Because mm-hmm. he gets hit on the face, gets the scar by Bill McKinney. And go. so that was, I was always a fan of Bill McKinney's, you know, just from that. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, everyone goes and says, you know, who did the voice of Jonah Hex? And I said, Bill McKinney, the guy from Deliverance. And I'm like, <laughs> why do you focus on that? <laughs> It's like he didn't he didn't get the job because he could do like an ornery hillbilly. Right. Right. He did he got the job because of Outlaw Josie Wales, you know. Mm -hmm. He's he's such a great Western voice. Well, that's it's funny. We I think the so the the one Batman the animated series wiki page is like, oh, he's most famous for his role in deliverance. So on his actual Wikipedia page, though, we went and looked it up and we're like, holy cow. This guy was in yeah. seven or eight other Western films. He worked with Clint Eastwood before, most notably in this Josie Wales movie. Like that should be the headline because so many we, we've talked about it with you before and on our show. Uh, you know, anytime that it seemed that Andrea could get somebody that fit with the theme of the episode yeah. or was familiar with that type of characterization, it just fit for the show. So why would you not get somebody that had worked with Clint Eastwood before in a very yeah. similar characterization like this? Yeah, and also he worked with John Wayne using the shooters. You know, it's like you, you, it's like so. Anyway, yeah, I you you get it, you right? Know. Absolutely. Set that record straight. We didn't get him because he, you know, <laughs> Ned Beatty. That's right. 
Exactly. That, that wasn't that wasn't the one that got him the job. <laughs> That's and, awesome. And I got to meet Elizabeth Montgomery. I was going to say this was I I believe this is her final acting role before she passed. Yeah, which just I, an institution, like a just an, another incredible. So while they, you know, they agreed to do it, right? Like you pinch yourself when I, when you meet someone like that, I'm sure. And and the weird thing is, is like she, you know, you 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 meet her, and it's like she had to have been sick. Mm. Like, she had to have been, but mm. you, man, it's like I I just looked at her, and it's like, man, she looks, she's just as pretty as she was in the '60s. Mm-hmm. It's just you know, just such a timeless, beautiful lady. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and she totally, I mean, she's playing the Madame, you know, which, you know, he hurt one of my girls real bad. <laughs> and, you know, we, we know what her job was. Right. Yes. yes. <laughs> so, but she just played it just, it's just like a subtle, and I, I and the fact, it's like that, that accent that she uses, mm-hmm. kind of a touch, you know, the touch of a Southern lady. Mm-hmm. So, you know anyway just like in the sympathy between her and hex mm-hmm. you know just just such a good job such a good job absolutely as say and that kind of informs that, that the interaction between them sort of informs jonah hex being so determined to grab uh you know him at the end of the episode is like no it's not because I'm defending the good old US of A. It's because you're a bad man and I catch yeah. bad men. Like that's that's what it comes down to at the end. Yeah. And then then going back to like what has to be cut, you know, there's certain things that just had to had to stay in, you know. But there was stuff at the beginning where he's coming into the town. Mm-hmm. There was more reaction of people and um there was several of those shots which i just that were animated and i just wanted to keep and just because you know there's a bruce had to like pick on a pip, pickle barrel and there's like this guy just <laughs> chomping on you know just <laughs> chomping on a pickle, eating a pickle and he's like Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> that guy cut um you know oh, there's, there's just there's just subtle things you know with dogs running away from him mm-hmm. and you know once they see him and right just, just all these things leading up to his his final reveal mm-hmm. that were cut, um, which is you know, which really bugged me, but yeah. it had to be done. And then there's the one, the final one, the final cut that I just so get the, we get the thing that this is like a thir- this is like a minute shorter. Actually, I do remember it was a minute because a minute was like a stab to the heart. Yeah. So I'm sitting there with Joe Gall. And we're editing, and we're editing, and and this is on, a, you know, so it's actually cut and splice, cut and splice, mm-hmm. and we're just trying to get it, trying to get it down to time without losing too much, you know, because I I'm not gonna lose the broadside with the cannonballs flying at camera, right, right. I'm not gonna lose like the combat at the end, you know, it's like with all the guys like firing, and you'll notice we don't show anyone getting hit. Mm, yes. Um, Very damage strange. being done. It's like buildings are blowing up, and mm-hmm. you know, and you see the Gatling gun hits going up to the soldiers, and then we cut. Yes. Right. So, so you know, it, that's, so that's all for BS and P, and that was all great. But I'm not losing the Gatling guns and everything, mm-hmm. and I'm not losing Arcades. I'm not losing that sword fight. Mm. But I did. Lo- it's like I showed you guys earlier. There's the one shot where it's like where Duval is sent by, and there was actually more dialogue in in there, you know, in the uh, in the bridge of mm-hmm. the Phoenix of the ship, mm-hmm. where Jonah, you know, like where Jonah Hex is, you know, all hell has broken loose, mm-hmm. and it's like you know, it's like so where Rachel Ghoul tells Arcady Duval trying to remember exactly how the whole scene went mm-hmm. but there's an altercation where it's like now now he's really pissed off at his kid mm-hmm. he, he, he is pissed off and he like reprimands him in front of the whole bridge and then there's this guy that arcady goes is like go and handle this problem and he arcady goes and walks out and he's looking back over his shoulder 
And then he sees this guy who's kind of smirking at him, mm-hmm. who has a saber. He's an officer, so he has a saber. Mm-hmm. And Katie Duvall is like, well, how do you unsheathe the saber? And I had him grab the saber, and the animation was beautiful. And he just grabs the guy by the face and shoves him off camera. <laughs> <laughs> He's got the saber. And then the next time you see him, he stripped off his coat and bowler, and now he's, you know, I have the, the turret turn, and the door is open, and there's Arcady mm-hmm. already with his uh, saber. Man, sounds like it would have been a pretty good intro. Uh, like, it, it would have solidified just the... Yeah, like... it's, just, it's just a hook. It's just yeah. a hook. You know, now you know he has a saber, right. and it's it's a good reveal when he, we do see him with it, but... Okay seeing him where he gets it from would have just been like that ex- just an extra touch right yeah it reinforces duval's side of like he's been embarrassed in front of his men and he's yeah. trying to show how macho and tough he is and for his dad right <laughs> so he, i'll show the old man right like i'll show him up but also it re- it also reinforces going forward that little conversation that batman and rachel ghoul have at the end where he really he's like Hey, you know, even though he completely was a loose cannon and was not he like he proved to me he was not worthy of running my empire based on how he acted like, which is an interesting you could probably talk about this for another hour of like <laughs> Rachel Ghoul's characterization of like, even though he's this this man uh, bent on world domination he has like standards like you're not gonna whip people mercilessly you're not gonna torture them before you kill them like he's got standards he as over a the loudspeaker <laughs> and tells people to run away when he's gonna blow up the railroad like he's not indiscriminately <laughs> mowing down yeah. bystanders like I love that he has he has standards as a as a villain. Like that's pretty it's a pretty interesting dynamic. And I think that also plays into to Batman letting him go at the end, right? Because he's not yeah. an indiscriminate psychopath like the Joker who's just mowing down everyone. There's there is that little bit of like begrudging respect still between them where Batman's like, All right, this isn't this isn't really a crime being perpetrated here. We'll just let it go. And again, just you know, David Warner, it's like, my God. It's like, we'll cross swords another day. Yeah. Just just that delivery is like and I know Andrea is giving him direction, but by but just how naturally he embodies the role. Mm-hmm. And he wants, you know, it's not God, nowadays I don't know if anyone else would read the lines like that and be allowed right. to read them like that. Would it be some pontificating oaf? Right. <laughs> you know, out. We shall cross swords another day. Right. You know, it's like no, it's like he just does just so calmly and, and uh I think Troy did that sequence, the the end sequence. Mm. It's just like where he just goes Robin. You know. Mm. Robin's like, well, okay. <laughs> no, we just had a fight. These guys were shooting at <laughs> right. and shot up the nursing home there. You know? <laughs> we'll let him go. He's off to fly off. Uh, all right, we have one uh, one final question here, Kevin. So you already kind of touched on it a little bit, uh, that some other ideas like the Demon or Sergeant Rock. Um, if there was, you know, in the multiverse somewhere, you guys got 13 more episodes after these, and we're going to do another, you know, Ra's al Ghul in history story. Is there is there one of those where you're like, that's the one I'd do? Like, that's, is there one of those characters you'd want to match him up with? I mean, I would go to Enemy Ace. Yeah. really wow because well i mean that's something that I, w- I would like to do is like you know world war one aerial combat mm-hmm. animation wise uh it's it, it's almost a whole category all unto itself mm-hmm. because and that and that's another thing is like where in my mind i could create animation shortcuts mm-hmm. kind of like like when i did macross you know, mm-hmm. or I did, uh, was it Starcom was the one I did for Deke, but Macross or Starcom. The thing is, they're vehicle shows. Mm-hmm. So that's where you save your money is when the people are just this much is showing <laughs> and they're in, and all you're doing is cutting the close ups of them, mm-hmm. pulling the trigger or <laughs> moving that or kicking the pedals. Mm-hmm. Very simple bits of animation. Um, and then you figure out ways to animate the, the, uh, the planes. Mm-hmm. You know? There you so go. that would actually work out. And then just the whole atmosphere, the whole 
horror of World War One. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, how would Rachel Ghoul be dealing with that? You know, that would be very intriguing. It's like, would he open up his own front? Was mm-hmm. he responsible? Was he responsible for the death of the Romanovs? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Maybe good. he had the Romanovs killed off. Maybe that's what right. he's planning on. Now he's gonna kills off the Romanovs. Who are, they're all related. Mm-hmm. All the are one. They're related. Now he's going to work. Is he going to move on to Queen Victoria and her family? Mm. You know, that's. I love the tale. Oh, uh, yes. I'm, all right. So I get little Who do we talk just... to at DC to make sure this happens in some form or fashion? <laughs> we'll send emails immediately. <laughs> I, I have no idea. I don't, know, I don't even know what they're doing over there now. <laughs> Not many people seem to know. <laughs> oh, man. But. Kevin, thanks so much for uh, spending some time with us talking about this episode. What a uh, what a fun time! Um, we're excited to to kind of break it down here ourselves. And but uh, in the meantime, we know you're on Instagram. I've seen you've been doing. I don't know if your commissions are officially open, but I see you've been posting some artwork for commissions uh, that yes. you've done recently. It's been really cool. Um, so you know, uh, can people contact you directly for those? Are you is that more of a private thing? I'm not sure. Well, it's like yeah, they they can go. It's like um. I think if you go on to um, Instagram, it's mm-hmm. Altieri Arts. Mm-hmm. Um, there's, I have another one with just my name, but it's mm-hmm. like that. That was just, you know, I don't <laughs> ignore that. Yeah, you know, it's like that. That was back when you know Facebook was like dropping people left and right. And, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can also, and you can also go see Kevin Altieri. Um, you can contact me on Facebook. Okay, just message me. You know, I'll respond. Very cool. Well, Kevin's posted some really cool art. I've seen some some really awesome stuff that you've done with the Phantasm anniversary. Um, you know, the some Harley Quinn stuff. Some uh, some I saw you did a, a a Phantasm shot of the Batman putting on the cow on on canvas. I've seen digital art. You're doing it that all. One, that one was that was a commission that's already been sold. Man, man, yeah, was, that, that one I did sell that. Cool. One. Love that yeah. one. I did that one specifically for someone, you know, but uh, awesome. so cool. Um, but yeah, there's just, uh, I've been doing, well, you know, that's the problem with being unemployed. <laughs> <laughs> but I can actually, you know, it actually gives me time to do things like, you know, the painting I did of Mr. Freeze. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I love that one. So you know, cool. That's something that I've, uh, that's kind of Nora Freeze and, and Mr. Freeze is Dr. Fibes. Mm-hmm. You know, Nora, that that's kind of that was my contribution to the iconography. Mm-hmm. So, so good though. Schumacher swiped it. <laughs> <laughs> he had no right to do that. He <laughs> <laughs> He's like, this isn't pain on you, moron. How dare you? Uh, so great well Kevin we love having you on every time thank you so thank much you. for spending uh, you know a little over a half hour with us today chatting about this episode um, you know and uh, we can't wait to have you on again soon okay yeah, that'd be my pleasure thanks guys what an inc- <laughs> what an incredible uh, time there with Kevin Liam. Uh, we can't say enough uh, to to thank him not only for donating his time on such short notice, but I think you know it's interesting uh, when we looked at this episode was coming up on the when we saw that this episode was coming up on the on the uh, on the horizon. We thought, man, it would be really interesting to get some behind the scenes to figure out how this story came to be how did they pick jonah hex you know what 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 like what is this episode and uh i don't think we could have asked for more with that interview with kevin he gave us a a lot of incredible insight and uh we do once again thank him for his time and uh, he even showed us uh before we went on and started recording he showed us some of the storyboards that he did for the for the episode it was uh it was a really fantastic time and every time we have kevin on the the show it's a it's a treat but this one i think uh just hearing his passion and appreciation for mm-hmm. this particular episode was contagious enough to uh, to really, I think, in some ways influence how I ended up scoring the episode. Um, <laughs> yes. well, and, and hearing, that, hearing yeah. the love of uh, someone who made the show and how much time and effort was put into it, I think, uh, really puts it in a different perspective when you're when you're looking at this as opposed to just your run of the mill 22 minute watch and watch and chat that we do on a, on a usual show. 
Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it was great to hear him just talk about the different things that he that he loved about it and, you know, the influences and all of that. So once again, we thank you to Kevin for donating some of his time this week to uh, to chat with us about this episode. So, Liam, we don't have to uh, to give a full necessarily in-depth breakdown. And I feel like every time we say that we uh, we end up doing that anyway. But uh, we'll go ahead and give our today. We don't have the time. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, yeah, this is an extended bonus, big sized, uh, giant sized episode, as we would call it, uh, you know, with the with the uh, interview with Kevin. So we'll try and keep our synopsis just to the high points as we kick things off for the episode as uh batman and robin stumble upon a group of uh, what appears to be assassins who are pumping gas into uh, what we later find out is sort of a retirement home or a, a, a retirement facility uh rachel ghoul is present and accounted for and uh is uh, uh absconding with one of its residents batman and robin meanwhile are too busy fighting the uh the 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 league of assassins uh in order to uh to to stop him as he gets away uh but uh leaving behind uh he d- he doesn't leave them uh sort of scratching their heads too much as he does leave a cassette tape and hey this i don't think this is a piece of uh a, with the resurgence and appreciation for cassette tapes like there are bands that legitimately drop their albums mm-hmm. on cassette tapes these days we don't have to explain this technology to too many people i think that's right yeah i think it's a, it's a, it's retroactive we probably have the uh the Guardians of the Galaxy movie largely to thank for that resurgence. Uh, but yes, I think we generally you can figure out it's an audio recording that of Rachel Ghoul telling a story uh, to Batman and Robin as they race to the airport to try to try to catch him before he gets on this flight. Um, it's clear that he wants them to find him. The plane he's getting on is called Lazarus. He's not hiding at all. So clearly he wants Batman and Robin to meet him at the airport and he wants them to hear this story. There, Lazarus. It's too easy. He wants us to find him. Let's check this out. I anticipated meeting you tonight, detective. I hope the story I have to tell you may cause you to reconsider your pursuit. The year was 1883. Your government was ruthlessly expanding westward. From there, for most of the rest of the episode, we are taken away to a uh, to the old west, uh, you know, to the the wild wild west, if you will, um, <laughs> and which, as we talked about with Kevin, was a was a big influence on this uh, on this episode, especially in the latter half. But yes, we see an old gunslinger coming into town. We, of course, are very quickly introduced to Jonah Hex, a, uh, a bounty hunter. In uh, and uh, he's uh, he's sort of tasked with tracking down this uh, this mysterious rogue Arcady Duval. What a tremendous name, by the way. I don't think we, <laughs> I don't know who came up with that name, but incredible. We forgot to ask Kevin that. But what a what an incredible name for like a slimy uh, uh, old west fancy lad. Like that's right. Arcady Arcady. Duval. They don't make names like that anymore. Absolutely. But uh, Jonah Hex is uh, meets up with the. Um, the matron of a uh, a local establishment <laughs> i guess you would say mm-hmm. um who uh who gives jonah hex a little bit of info tells him where to find uh this arcade duval who is holed up as we find out in this enormous sort of factory inside of a cave duval comes into town now and then starts fights bothers my girls challenges men to duels I'm aware of his habits, Missy. What I ain't aware of is where he's holed up. Strange thing, that. He ain't staying at the hotel, and the next town's 50 miles away. Sounds like he likes to sleep on the ground with the rest of the snakes. He ain't the type. More the clean sheet sort. And he first showed up in town about the time folks started seeing the Sky Monster. The what? No one knows what it is. And the sheriff's too yellow to investigate. It only comes out at night like a big boat or a log in the sky. About the same time it showed, folks started seeing lights in the... Get down! The way I figure, that glow might some way tie in with the sky monster and Duval. Reckon so. I think you better start back now, Missy. 
got a feeling things might get loud and busy soon. Mm, good luck, Jonah Hex. Right nice sentiment, ma'am. But I never cotton much to luck. I like to make my own. I'll remember that when I see you next. And uh, Hex she does is... drop notes, by the way. She drops those hints about the mysterious sky monster that's appearing. That's right. That, the uh... sheriff is too cowardly to investigate. That's right. So we know there's, yeah, there's some sort of large, you know, a mechanical monster, if you will, out there. Mm-hmm. Although I guess we don't know it's mechanical quite yet. But <laughs> we quickly, as 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 he arrives at Arcadia Duval's uh, headquarters, we find out it's a giant factory inside of a cave. And uh, not only is Arcadia Duval there, but we see his his benefactor. Uh, the upper management is also there overseeing this project. None other than Rachel Ghoul himself. Who is uh, who is quick to discipline Arcady as he's uh, he's a bit Arcady is a bit more authoritarian with his discipline of his uh, employees and Raish doesn't really see the value in that and kind of routinely as becomes a theme keeps dressing uh, dressing Arcady down in front of the the men and uh, and uh, and just just it makes it clear that this guy is a real disappointment to Raish and uh, Hex is uh, is pretty quickly captured. And uh, taken taken prisoner by uh, by Duval's men, and uh, after uh, after a little bit more, like we said, we're trying to just skip. We're just trying to hit the big beats here, folks. So uh, after a, a bit of a bit of fisticuffs, he's able to escape, and we see what this uh, flying machine, this flying monster that uh, that the woman was referring to earlier in the episode. It's a giant airship with giant. Uh, giant hydrogen uh, gas balloons carrying carrying it through the city, and we find out why they're doing this. In fact, is none other than Rachel Ghoul's plan. As as what else would Rachel's plan be? But he is upset with the construction of the railroad, the first railroad connecting the east and west coasts of the United States, because of the devastation it has had on the forestation of uh, of the United States. And so he's taking this. Uh, this giant airship, and he's just opening fire on on the railroad. Work, you lazy good for nothing! Huh? I've told you repeatedly, this is not how I do things. I beg your pardon, sir. I was hoping to expedite the completion of the airship. Commendable but not at the expense of my work force. Good men are hard to find in these parts, and there is still much to be done. The government's western expansion is destroying this land. Drastic steps must be taken to preserve the wilderness. And Ray Charru is the one to do it. Who better than I? I'll destroy the railroad and bomb other railroad junctions as I move eastward toward Washington. Once Washington is in flames, I'll force the United States government to declare me master of America. Whatever you say. And, well, uh... and let's not bury the lead here. After he destroys, the, he's he's defending the the forestation. That is a big part of it. But he's gonna not gonna stop with this one railroad. He's going all the way back across towards the east, destroying every railroad junction in his path until mm-hmm. he gets to Washington, and then he's gonna make them force them to make him the master of America. That's right. <laughs> I, uh, yeah. So he's he's got he's got grand designs as Raish always does. Uh, under the guise of uh, of perhaps protecting the environment, but yes, he's uh, this is his plan, and they open fire, and it's it's clear that the soldiers that are that are there to defend are quite overmatched with their muskets. That uh, Raish Raish has uh, advanced technology here that they simply cannot match, as he's got this flying machine with giant cannons and machine guns and all of this. So. Uh, as as we approach, uh, as we said, Jonah Hex is able to escape and make his way onto the airship. He uh, contends with some of the henchmen before having a sword and sword versus knife fight with Arcady Duval, and uh, he sets off a cannon which blows up one of the giant hydrogen engines, uh, causing the ship to crash. Raish escapes on a on a great old timey Wright Brothers plane. And uh, and as we uh, as we finish our story, Duval begs Jonah Hex, offers him five thousand dollars in gold to leave him alone. 
But as has been clear, uh, as as we talked about with Kevin, uh, Jonah Hex ain't uh, he he ain't doing this for old Uncle Sam. He's not exactly uh, maybe the biggest fan of the uh, the United States government, but he is a bounty hunter and he is a man with a certain code, and that code means that he's got to bring Duval in alive for uh, for as they allude to quote what you did to that girl uh back east so that's sort of where our tale ends five thousand in gold take it leave me be it ain't about money boy it's about justice and i aim to serve you son let me live please i will only because it's too much trouble to haul your stinking carcass back east I'm getting too old for this. And as uh, as Batman and Robin arrive on the tarmac, as Ra's is about to board his flight, we get the reveal of just who that uh, that that old person at the nursing home that Ra's absconded with at the start of the episode is. Yes, indeed, the dynamic duo finally confronting Raish. Raish uh, kind of filling in the blanks as to why uh, that tale was relevant as uh, they reveal that the person in the wheelchair that they've absconded with is, in fact, Duval. As we see, the scar matches the scar on Duval's face. Batman, being the world's greatest detective, has already deduced that this was Duval, and that's why Raish was telling him this tale. But what he doesn't quite understand is uh, why he went through all of this trouble uh Raish continues to mention that after uh, after uh Jonah Hex remanded him into custody of the authorities he was sentenced to 50 years hard labor but uh Batman also of course is confused as to how over 100 years later he could still be alive Raish of course mentions that after that 50 years of hard labor uh, he, of course, allowed him to utilize the Lazarus pits, which has kept him alive this long. However, the Lazarus pits effects no longer work. And uh, Batman, again, is starting to put the pieces of the puzzle together, but not quite all of them, as Raish finally reveals that his deep care for Duvall, even though he re- quickly realized that he was not someone that would be able to uh, succeed him in his quest for uh, for ruling the world, uh, as he has so often tried to recruit Batman for, uh, he does reveal that Duval was in fact one of his sons, and in uh, mm-hmm. and that that is the true reason why he couldn't turn his back on him at this point, despite all of their differences, and the the fact that they they couldn't quite ever see eye to eye, and that they did things very differently, and that he wasn't worthy of inheriting Raish's uh, crown, so to speak. Uh, he does have a deep love for him as his son. You left Duval to his fate a century ago. Why come back for him now? Did you really think, Detective, that in my 600 years of life I would have sired only one offspring? Even before the Phoenix debacle, I had come to realize that Arcady was too unbalanced and cruel to wisely rule my empire. But you couldn't forget about him. What father can ever forget his son? Come now, detective. I've still a few good years left. We will cross swords another day. But for now, let me take my boy home. He requests that Batman leave him be and uh, allow them to to take each other on on another day as Raish reminds him as he has several good years left in which they'll be able to cross paths. But in the meantime... He requests of Batman to let him go and uh, to uh, to be with his son for his final final moments on Earth. And Batman obliges, uh, closes his cape, turns back to the to the Batmobile, and speeds off as he allows Raish to board the plane uh, with his dying son. And that's uh, that's kind of where we we end things on for the episode, Liam. So Batman uh, knows that he'll live to fight another day against Raish, and we see this odd sort of dynamic in their relationship of Mm -hmm. mutual respect as Batman shows him respect in a way uh, to allow him to sort of uh, experience these last moments with his son in peace. So uh, yeah, Uh, let's go ahead and chat about uh, our, our thoughts on the plot. As I mentioned, I I think uh, if you had asked me, you know, 20, 20 years ago, even 30 years ago, what I thought of this episode, 
well, this episode wasn't around 30 years ago, but 28 years ago, when I thought of this episode, I don't know that uh, I would have ranked it very high. As we mentioned, not a lot of Batman. It's not very true to the to the series in the way that uh, you're used to. But I think looking at this through a critical eye, knowing the backstory and the influences, we talked about how the Wild Wild West uh, television show was uh, was a b- big favorite of ours. Uh, mm-hmm. It was our, it was a favorite of our, of our dads and then passed down to us as a favorite. And we enjoyed that. So that being an influence of the episode, you can see the hallmarks of a wild, wild west episode throughout this as an influence. And I think just the idea of sort of an old gunslinger on his last leg, um, that is a, a classic DC hero that, uh, you know, as we talked about with Kevin, wasn't someone that we could appreciate as kids, but now that we're older, we know a little bit about the history of the character and, and can appreciate it a little bit more. I, I think it, it changes how I look at this episode. It certainly changes how I look at this episode. Um, it's also so far out of the box in so many ways <laughs> for swing. what the yeah. show was. Yeah. The, 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 a big What's, swing yeah yeah and and you have uh you know you have you have uh three huge giants of this this show working on it with with paul dini and bruce tim and kevin all working together to create the story and collaborating and, and bringing it to life and you know the, how, how this ended up on fox is still like a head scratcher it's pretty funny uh hearing kevin talk about that but yeah i think all of that works together for a really interesting episode and the and the batman parts I think it does further that mutual respect that Batman and Raish have for each other. It adds that that odd dynamic and the differentiation, as you mentioned when we were talking to Kevin about the the Raish character versus a Joker or a you know Killer Croc or any of these sort of maniacal villains who are simply out to murder people for the fun of it. Versus this kind of mutual respect that they have uh, between between the two. So, yeah, I, I think all of that works together. And I think looking at the episode, understanding a little bit more of the of the uh, subtext and, and things that weren't you weren't able to quite appreciate. You know, he's out seeking revenge for this lady of the night that was victimized mm-hmm. by this guy, you know, and it's, it's, it's very old West on, on the nose for that stuff. So I, I really enjoyed this episode, um, especially of course, with the insight from Kevin and, and, and the, the eye, eyes of an adult sort of being able to appreciate the influences and the, mm-hmm. the stylization of the episode. So uh, for all those reasons, I ended up giving it a, a pretty strong eight out of 10 for my score. Yeah, I give it the exact same score. Um, I think it's uh, I think it's a really, really uh, like we like for all the reasons you've just talked about. It's so outside of the box. Uh, the story told is is an interesting one. Like we said, Jonah Hex is not the squeaky clean protagonist. Uh, you know, as we talked about with Kevin, there was sort of this idea that he was a you know an East Texan Confederate, you know, old 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 Confederate, and that he's not necessarily you know. He's not he, his ledger isn't necessarily the cleanest, but he's got sort of this moral code. And at the end of the day, he's he's nearing the end of his life, and he's he's sort of a, a little bit uh, you know a man out of time almost. And uh, and I and I, I like that aspect of it. I think it's really interesting take on him to not do maybe you know he's not he's not young you know quipping. He's this old he's this old man nearing the end of his life, nearing the end of his adventures, and. And I, I just think that's a that's a really interesting slant to take on Jonah Hex on top of just the fact that we got a Jonah Hex story at all. Um, I think that's that's really interesting. And then and then the ending with with Raish, as we talked about, it's the the very unique uh, Raish and uh, Batman relationship that he doesn't have with with uh, you know any of his other villains really, which is that he there is this sort of respect and I, and the, the personal nature in which race appeals, uh, appeals to Batman, like give this father a little more time with his son, like who better than Batman would, would want, you know, who, who Bruce Wayne would not stand in the way of that. Right. Like it's, it's, it's a, it's kind of a beautiful poetic moment when he, you know, when he asks, just let, let me take my boy, like, let me, let me just go. And, and, you know, he's the, the implication being like, he's old, he's going to die soon. I just want to be with him when he goes and, mm. and, and who is, 
you know, Batman's not going to stand in the way of that. There'll be, you know, there'll be plenty of times to, as he says, cross swords later, later on. So it's, uh, I, I just, I just think that ending is fantastic. And, and the whole, the whole idea of, of doing this story, doing an old West story. It's also like, 1995 there wasn't like a lot of cowboy stuff around like i feel like it's almost you know you can do a western now you know there's quentin tarantino movies and you know big triple a blockbuster video games where you're where you're a cowboy now i feel like this episode maybe wouldn't be as much of out of left field if they if it was a on an episode you know let's say an episode of batman caped crusader did a join a hex episode or Batman the Brave and the Bold, if, as we talk about from time to time, it wouldn't seem so out of left field. But the you know cow, cowboys, as as we talked about with Kevin, steampunk wasn't really an aesthetic that existed yet. We'll certainly talk more about that in visuals in a second. So, just the uniqueness and the willing to take such a big swing, and the you know the specific way they told the story, and and the you know the era age age that Jonah Hex is in the story. And then that ending with, uh, as I said, with with Ration Batman on the tarmac is, I, I think, just fantastic. Yeah, and I think last thing I'll just add to that is I think now it would be easy. It's easy to look through in 2023 eyes. You've had sort of the, the burned out hero um, trope is sort of like a, a tried and true Hollywood story nowadays. You know, we've seen it done so incredibly well with the... Uh, the Logan movie, like the, you know, the old man Logan movie and all, 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 you know, everything since then that it's come out and sort of repeated this, you know, I'm too old for this stuff, tired out, worn out hero who's on his last leg. Like that's again, at the, at this time in 1995, you, you didn't quite have as many stories like that outside of those classic Western stories that, that, you know, were the direct influence for a lot of this, this material. So I love that, you know, history continues to repeat itself. It's, you know, time is a flat circle and all of that stuff. But, you know, when you look at this at that time, this was this was not drawing off of any of that modern stuff that we've seen now, and especially in superheroes that plays so much into that same theme. So, again, another outside of the, the box thought of like bringing in the, those, uh, you know, worn down uh cowboys uh, you know back on for one last rodeo so to speak so yeah i i, I love love that all of that uh i think certainly reflects in our our high scores and, and high praise certainly for the plot all right Liam, let's move on to our next category which is going to be animation and visuals we talked a lot about some of the influence already and uh with kevin we talked a lot about the fun stuff so we don't have to hit all of the high notes again uh for this but we can certainly uh, discuss some of the uh, the things that maybe we didn't talk about or any of th- the things that we want to reiterate. But Dong Yang, uh, responsible for the animation for this week. And uh, it's interesting because I think one of the, the things that Kevin mentioned uh, specifically when he was talking about uh, some of the, the action sequences, specifically that final sword fight, was he was so pleased with the way that that final sword fight came out that it didn't bother him as much that characters were off model or what have you. And I, I think that that directly certainly was one of the first things when you and I watched it together uh, that this this noted, like there's a lot of wonky looking character models here in this episode uh, and it varies from scene to scene. Um, and it's interesting because we don't have we don't have that much screen time for characters that would have a standard model. So it's maybe it's just more glaringly obvious in those few short sequences our our opening sequence at the the old folks home with Batman versus the uh, and and Robin versus the uh, the League of Shadows or and and or that final sequence with uh, with Raish on the tarmac. But um, yeah, overall, the I think the the character models were what stood out as the big negative for me, which is a fraction of what we ended up getting for the episode as far as as far as I'm concerned for for low lights. Absolutely. Uh, I think the I think the strong points, of course, for the episode are are going to be the you know certainly the set pieces. We talked about how with Kevin that these are all new character models, and uh, they had a lot of fun with that. That final sequence on the once they board the Phoenix and they you know they're 
uh, the the fisticuffs, the hand to hand combat that uh, that that Jonah Hex has with the with the men on board, and then the the sword fight, and it's interesting because I think when I watch the sword fight a second time, I think the animation for that and the way that the characters ended up being animated, while it doesn't look standard for maybe the rest of the, the BTOS run, it is very streamlined and similar to the Superman, the animated series uh, animation that we would see. It is, I think it's a little less, there's a, there's a little less cell shading. And some of that is because I think most of the action takes place during the day outside on the hull of the ship. Right. Um, or on the deck of the ship, but it's, so you don't have as much shadow and, and things, things that, uh, that add those, those cell shading, but uh, it is like the, the bend and stretch and, and stuff that, uh, that Kevin alluded to really does create more of a dynamic streamlined look that we would later see, you know, in the next series. So, mm-hmm. um, I think when looking at that, I was like, oh, okay, all right, I can see the DNA of how this stuff was streamlined and made to look a little bit more, a little bit more, uh, um, you know, uh, easier to animate, I think from, from an episode like this, where you're in the final run of this, of this, this BTOS series. So very interesting. Um, again, I don't know how much of that had to do with the, the, the daylight and, uh, affecting everything, but I, it was just something that I noticed. I felt like the characters could have also been the storyboard artists eventually worked on some of the Superman stuff, of course, too. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I did notice, notice that, but, um, yeah, I think, I think the we talked about the airplanes and the way that the airplanes looked. I will just say I didn't I, we didn't get a get a chance to talk about it with uh, Kevin directly, but I love period piece Rachel Ghoul's top hat and oh, incredible, <laughs> incredible. Yeah, we really should have mentioned that to him. I yeah, I, I don't know if that's a uh, if that's a, a who who gets the credit for designing that uh, that outfit, but it's just perfect. Like. The tallest top hat you've ever seen. The monocle. The it's just <laughs> Mr. Peanut. Absolutely. It's so... <laughs> He's got the spats. He's got it all. You know. Oh, it's incredible. Yeah, he he looks fantastic. He uh, he wears it well. But yes, there's there's so much as as we talked about with Kevin in that in that third act, especially that's just so unique. As you said, they basically had to design a whole world from from the ground up, as he said with his. Uh, you know, with people that worked on the backgrounds all the way to the, you know, the incidental characters, the extras, if you will, uh, all the way through to, you know, our giving, uh, you know, Arcady and, 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 uh, and Raish their, their unique looks. This, as we said, older, haggard uh, Jonah Hex, which, I mean, as we've alluded to all week on social media, he does bear a striking resemblance, this, uh, this older Jonah Hex, striking resemblance to, uh, former Minnesota governor and uh, pro wrestling hall of famer, Jesse, the body Ventura. It is, it, it must be said. <laughs> yeah. That, that was an immediate, like I, you know, we've talked about predicting the future and retroactive Easter eggs. I don't think they could have predicted that one in a million years that <laughs> drawing draw, the, the drawing of old man, Jonah Hex would so strongly resemble uh, Jesse, the body, but uh, yeah, uh, once you see it, you really can't unsee it. And it's uh, it's, it's made, it's made this week extremely fun. In fact, I'm going to cut in here. I, I created a sequence using uh, the wonderful world of AI. What would it sound like if Jesse, the body Ventura was cast for this episode as uh, as Jonah Hex. Let's roll that. It would appear we have ourselves a government spy. A rather disreputable looking one at that. Well, Mr. Spy, I'd say your plan has failed and the railroad is doomed. I ain't no spy. I'm Jonah Hex. And I don't give a tinker's cuss about no railroad. I've come to get you, Arcady Duvall, on account of what you've done to that girl back east. You mean to say you've tracked me across 12 states because of this? Well, there's also the matter of a $200 reward. That don't hurt my feelings none. You're either a liar or a fool. I've been known to be foolish, but ain't nobody calls me a liar and goes to bed happy. Give him a lead box. Unbelievable. I uh, I was rolling when you when you sent that to me the, uh, during the week here, and uh, I think it's posted on our socials as well. If you'd like to just 
just uh, isolate uh, robot robot <laughs> Jesse Ventura voicing uh, voicing Jonah Hex's lines, but it's it matches up almost a little too well. It's it's so uh, it's so funny com- combined with the visual, as we mentioned, of uh, the uh, the long the long white uh, skullet, I believe that's referred to. Mm-hmm. Um, just uh, yeah, really, that, I love that uh, that Jonah Hex design. It's so striking. The big yellow eye mm-hmm. he has with it on the. Uh, uh, you know, and the and the hole in his face and everything is uh, just uh, just incredible. I believe I believe Kevin credits Bruce Tim with uh, with that specific character design. Um, so, yeah, just just great. The like I said, it's it's hard to find too much fault. Uh, I think Kevin even says that it's like who cares if they're on model when like everything else looks so good. Uh, uh, I, I I will say I and the only other thing that I really wanted to mention in, in visuals uh, that uh, we've probably already uh, may have alluded to in the interview with Kevin, I think uh, is uh, as mentioned, Robin, as, as Kevin always likes to point out, Robin fights dirty and the, the shot of Robin just like squatting down, throwing the punch. And then we see the, the very expressive sort of Spider-Man like eyes of the, uh, the league of assassins uh, ninja uh, as, uh, as, as Robin connects, <laughs> connects with his uh his below the belt shot we'll say uh just just perfect incredible comedy the way the the way it's cut around as 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 we've talked about you can't necessarily show the impact of it but uh it's uh, it's incredible and i think it was also used in a lot of uh as we talked about off the air a lot of fox kids ads used Mm -hmm. this clip Mm -hmm. um of of robin punching this guy in the groin so uh really that's that's a moment from the series that uh, that always sticks out to me uh from this episode as well it's just uh as uh, another another example as uh, as as is often the case in uh robin appearances with uh with a kevin altieri directed episode is he's uh he's a dirty fighter he likes to uh he likes to uh to find a way to work that in and it's uh it's a great little sequence at the start with uh with Batman and Robin arriving to take on the, uh, the, the ninjas while Raish and Ubu go collect uh, Duvall. So. No, no, I agree. I think, I think one of the hallmarks of this episode, and we, 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 uh, we briefly mentioned it to, to Kevin with, with standards and practices rules about things and what could and couldn't be seen is there's a lot of cutting around and, and showing things without showing it. The, the scene where, where Jonah Hex gets captured, uh, after, you know, in, uh, initially, by uh by arcades men he's uh it's only sh- you only see the shadows of them tackling him and then there's like four or five closed punches like you hear the impact and you see the mm-hmm. shadows punching something like you can't quite make out what it is but they're clearly connecting and beating jonah hex and that's something you couldn't show the closed fist violence with but the artistic way of hey we're gonna shoot up you see the top of the cave and the light the light uh you know casting these shadows up there and then them beating him his, the shadows are beating him um that and then the the even the opening sequence of 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 jonah hex as he arrives into uh into this small town is you you don't they don't show his face you only see you know knees up or or uh, knees down or or mm-hmm. neck down for the first little opening sequence but you see everybody's reaction to this horrific looking scarred man and then even when the people in the the saloon see him they also sort of freak out and then you don't get the full reveal you only get the half of it, the good side of his face and then eventually you turn and see this horribly scarred man just what the storytelling of what you don't see uh obviously a hallmark of this of this show Show. that's how they got around so much of the, the standards and practices but man uh that the storytelling that you're able to do through music the you know the voice acting and certainly even the visuals of what you don't see the implied visuals are is so so strong and uh you know uh done so well repeatedly over in this episode just for all those reasons uh you know we talked about it already just the the steampunk aesthetic uh even with the characters being off model in in some of right. the scenes uh we didn't even talk about Rachel Ghoul's cape movement in the final uh, on the tarmac in the final mm-hmm. scene we get some cape movement there from from Rache and uh very dramatic like batman is standing there with his cape at his back and then like wraps it around himself when he's leaving mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. very it's very very dramatic movements in that in that last scene 
Yeah, it's uh, it's great. Uh, I think this episode is really strong. Maybe surprised me, especially based on how off model everybody looked at that at the beginning, but uh, <laughs> makes up for it with all these new character models and the different things that uh, that Kevin mentioned, uh, you know, throughout the throughout the episode there. But I ended up giving it a pretty strong eight out of ten. Maybe even based solely on that swashbuckling finale of a sword yeah. fight. Really, really fun stuff in that one too. Yeah, I actually, uh, I went one point higher. I went nine out of 10. I just think it's, uh, yeah, I, I will say, uh, especially Robin's face, I feel like just kept changing sizes and that <laughs> took me out of it a little bit. So that might've knocked it down from the perfect score. But, but as, uh, as, like I said, as, as Kevin said in his, uh, in his interview with us, uh, when the rest of it looks so good, you can, uh, you can forgive little things like that a lot. And that's certainly the case with that. Uh, really that entire third act but as you mentioned yes him him sort of skulking around in the in the factory beforehand and when he hides uh, uh, when he hides under the hay to fool the guard and then oh i love that sequence so uh, good fantastic and then again you talk about one of the one of the cuts where you get the the fist flying towards the camera and then the big red flash and then the guards on the ground just uh just great stuff so um just yeah and and as uh, as uh, as kevin talked about just the fact that they had to design an entire an entire town and then uh, all these vehicles and then the soldiers and, and the crowd, you know, and the crowd listening to the, uh, the governor, whoever give their speech. Uh, Yeah. It's just, it's just an incredible achievement for, I mean, this is just, this isn't, this isn't a standalone movie. This wasn't, this was uh, just one of, uh, of however many, you know, the last, the last 10 or 20, you know, 22 minute cartoons they got to do for Fox, uh, for Fox kids here. This was just one of them. And the fact that they put so they were able to put so much time and effort into uh, creating this entire world, uh, you know, essentially it, it ends up being a one and done because we don't ever, we don't get any more uh, adventures of Jonah Hex in the old West. So it's uh, the amount of effort is just, it's just staggering and, and how good everything looks, especially in that third act. It's just, uh, it's just incredible. Absolutely. Uh, and I'm, somebody's going to tweet if we don't mention it. But yes, of course, Jonah Hex does return in, uh, in Justice League Unlimited, but that doesn't count. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, yeah. We'll... Yeah, he's, a, he's the younger. That's like, uh, I don't know, he's played by, well, would I would, you know, honestly, I would say he kind of looks like Josh Brolin, but that brings up, uh, <laughs> that brings up an uh, unfortunate comparisons to the live action film. So he's, he's a much younger man at that point, And he, he looks looks and and sounds completely different, so it's really not uh, not comparable, in my opinion, to and, the, yeah, the and, hex we yeah. see here. Yeah, and it's not the, the the it's not a Jonah Hex focused episode. He's a he's a character in the show, but he's it's not com- the star of the episode as as he was in this case. So. We will move on, Liam, to our next category, which is going to be music. And I believe you said at the top, Todd Haven responsible for the music. Correct. Not a not a name we're another this is another one I think maybe towards the back end of these VTOS episodes there were more uh I w I don't wouldn't say fill in, but not full time working on the series uh composers. Um I, I will say I expected maybe more like old west music like i was expecting uh the forgotten almost you know harmonica, straight you know, up a harmonica. lot of harmonica and acoustic guitar and and that sort of thing and we don't we get a little bit of it and we certainly get that i think at, like at the beginning when when hex is walking in the town and mm-hmm. uh and uh, and at the end when he's loading you know when he loads duval up on his shoulder and he's gonna take him to take him to face justice we get we get touches of it and uh but it's uh we get we still get a lot of like grand horns and and things like when the phoenix is revealed and stuff they don't they don't lean too hard on the 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 i guess the the pat old west music aesthetic for this like they still go for more and maybe that plays into the you know the sort of the again now we would call it steampunk but the sort of retro uh, you know the retro science fiction the old west science fiction of this giant uh you know this giant factory and this giant flying ship with uh with cannons and machine guns where it didn't necessarily feel appropriate to do you know gunslinger you know this town ain't big enough for the two of us music but yeah it didn't necessarily lay into the the old west aesthetic as much as you might expect them to 
Yeah, it's definitely, I mean, it, it is the first thing you hear when the title card pops up. And then mm-hmm. as uh, as we get his reveal, uh, Jonah, him being Jonah Hex, Jonah Hex is uh, walking through the town. There's some harmonica there. It does play, interestingly enough, it plays in that final sequence at the, on the tarmac. When they reveal that it's Arcady, uh, up to that point, it's strings, it's sort of like laying, laying low in the background. And then once they cut and you kind of get the verbal reveal that this is Arcady, you you see you they show his face and then the harmonica comes back in and he sort of melds the harmonica in with the strings for that final sequence. But to your mm-hmm. point, the reveal of the phoenix as the shadow is cast across this town and uh, as it's as it's laying waste to this uh, to this railroad town, uh, that is all strings and horns and and you know uh, some flute as as uh, as they're thrown overboard and stuff like that. So it doesn't it doesn't completely. Uh, rely or lay in as like you said as you might expect to a more western theme and i don't know if that was hey we we're already doing so much that's different when it comes to the the animation you know the storytelling that we're doing here we don't want it to feel completely alien like we're going completely outside of the box so let's keep it somewhat grounded in what we're used to in the orchestra um it's probably also using the resources that they had available you have a giant full orchestra to to score your uh to score your episode so you're going to use some of those other instruments uh for the the more serious heavy scenes i really like the way that that the sword fight is is done it starts with horns and strings um it actually starts there was like a a similar pacing to the strings um at the beginning of it and we'll talk about it here why that that matters so much but it's the similar tempo and and pacing to the metallo theme that brings in the strings it's a very similar feeling it's not exact it's not the same tune but it's the same tempo and pace as the sword fight is starting and it's like uh, it 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 just i was like man that that reminds me so much of the metallo piece like you could tweak that tune a little bit and get the metallo tune out of it so very interesting there that i noticed but then as the uh as the, the phoenix begins to crash you get this one sequence that's completely drums that has just like a little bit of bass behind it but it's mm-hmm. mostly just drums playing and then it cuts to harmonica mixed with strings as they're as they're sort of evacuating the uh or as as uh as arcadian and a hex come face to face in this final sequence where he's begging for his life. So, uh, yeah, overall it is, there are different portions of it that certainly feel like that set in the old West, your traditional Western, uh, music, but it's not, it's not a complete overhaul. Um, I probably would have liked to have hear, heard that a little bit more if I'm, if I'm being honest with you, uh, which is why I, I ended up giving music a, a seven out of 10. I still think there's a lot of great sequences. Oh, yeah. I think that that, that sword fight, the way that the music sort of is, is sort of this amalgamation of everything. And especially that one piece with just drums with just like a little, yes. little tiny tune behind it. I really liked it. So, uh, but still seven out of 10 is still a pretty good score. I'd say. Yeah, uh, in fact, I agree so much. I gave it the exact same score of seven out of ten. Um, definitely, like you said, definitely some memorable moments. The the all drum sequence or mostly drum sequence, I did really enjoy. Um, but uh, yeah, not necessarily like a. And there there certainly is like a Jonah Hex theme. I think we hear as we, as we just talked about, but it's not a, you know, it's not one that necessarily sticks with you the way that some of the other grand character themes uh, do. So still a, a very strong score from both of us though. Absolutely. Liam, let's roll on to our final category of the day, which is going to be our voice acting. Uh, we talked about some of our players already uh, and some of their previous roles. So we'll just uh, touch on them briefly here for this week's episode, but uh, let's go ahead and talk about the voice cast and uh, give some scores for our voice actors. Absolutely. So as mentioned, we had Elizabeth Montgomery, uh, Samantha from the classic Bewitched television series herself uh, playing the, uh, as she is credited, barmaid uh, in this episode. Sure, (laughs) sure. I guess we can call it that. 
Uh, we also have, uh, as mentioned, uh, Michael Bell as the airman. We have William Bryan as the sheriff. And uh, sitting Senator, or former, I believe he's now uh, just recently left office, actually. But uh, uh, Senator Patrick Lee, Leahy, Leahy, is it Leahy? How is it? Leahy. Leahy. Senator Patrick, Patrick Leahy as, uh, as the governor uh, gets, a, gets, a, gets a nice long speech there and uh and uh and that's that's just kind of a weird fun note that that gentleman in addition to being a a long serving senator in the state of vermont happens to just pop up in a lot he's a big batman guy Mm -hmm. as it turns out and uh a lot of batman i think he's been in all like a bunch of the last several batman themed movies that i know i'm aware that's right i feel like so technically batman forever which he was in uh came out first Mm-hmm. Though I imagine he recorded his lines for this episode before Batman Forever uh, came out, so uh, or maybe concurrently, who knows? But uh, but yes, these uh, those are his sole credits. If you look at it, it's Batman Forever, Batman and Robin, The Dark Knight. Oh, I'm sorry, he was in My Wife Is a Vampire too. So. <laughs> <laughs> and then the uh, The Dark Knight Rises and Batman v Superman. So uh, yeah, fun fun little cameo from a. Uh, from at the time a sitting uh, civil servant there but uh yeah getting to our our main cast we of course have uh bill mckinney as jonah hex uh as mentioned though perhaps to a layman like uh like uh like ourselves maybe best known for his role in uh, deliverance he also worked alongside as as kevin mentioned people like uh john wayne people like clint eastwood he is a he is, you know, that era of of Hollywood in, in the way that superhero. It's something that I think is ha- hard to comprehend, maybe for our generation and and people younger than us. But it's like the way that westerns dominated uh, cinema, the way that superheroes or or other sort of you know you know over the top action movies maybe in in past uh, in the past couple of decades have. Uh, westerns were everywhere and mr mckinney uh, had a role in quite a few of them so uh yeah him playing the the aging the aging cowboy going out for you know one of his last adventures here uh you know wasn't wasn't too much of a of a tough ask i don't think for uh for mr mckinney but uh i yeah i love i love old man jonah hex like i think he's got a he's just got a real funny like sort of sardonic wit about him and then he's He's not. Uh, he might not be the the nicest guy or the most upstanding citizen. He uh, he clearly has this sort of this this ultimate code that he lives by about the uh, about what's right and what's wrong. And he's gonna you know see to it that this this Duval guy, no matter what, he, you know he's old. He's swinging around on ropes as everything blows up around him in this big flying machine. But but gosh darn it, he's gonna get his man. He's a bounty hunter and he's gonna get his man. <laughs> Yeah, he's uh I think I think his performance is very much in the style of like that that old that old western. I mean, he's he's playing a, a cowboy from an old western. Like that's what he's doing. Um I think if you aren't familiar with that style of acting or that particular characterization of someone, you might think that these lines are maybe just kind of being understated or, you know, he's just kind of going through the motions because he doesn't show a lot of emotion, but that's, that's the characterization of that style character. Oh yeah. Very, you know, very humble and down to earth. He's got a, he's got a line or two that, that'll let you know that he's not, you know, he's not going to roll over and play dead. He's Mm -hmm. got a couple quips. They're going to be understated, but he'll cut you with them. Like, you know, he, he certainly goes out of his way to make sure that he tries to, tries to match wits with Arcady and he does so pretty well. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I think if you, if you're not familiar with the old westerns or how those characters tended to talk in those movies you might not be a fan of this performance but i think our love and appreciation for that old style of hollywood and specifically a character that was was uh was written like this i he fits that character that 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 quiet humility just going about his business. This is his job. He's going to bring killers to justice and then he's going to go have a drink and he's going to talk the same way that he does to, you know, the madam at the, at the saloon that he does to the sheriff and talk, mm-hmm. talk to the, to the, uh, to the evil guy that, 
that uh, did whatever he did to the the woman that he's trying to defend. Like he's he talks to them all with the same tone. Nothing gets too excited. He's not too excitable. He's not too stressed. He's not too angry. Uh, he's just kind of monotone. But I think that that's the characterization versus like this guy can't act. So yeah, I I, I appreciated that that characterization that uh, that he chose to give for this character. Absolutely, and uh, I think we talked about this a little bit with Kevin as well, but the it's understated on purpose to your point, like, which is basically what you've just been saying for three minutes. I'm just repeating it, but, uh, but no, I think like these, he's purposefully understated and, and not showing, you know, maybe a traditional cartoon voice actor emotion, but it's uh, it's pretty perfect when you realize, you know, that's, that's the role he was, uh, he was hired to play. Um, and, uh, and speaking of some of our other voice actors, we of course have the great Malcolm McDowell, as we talked about, we already talked about his uh, uh, with with Kevin. We talked about the 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 book series and movies that sort of inspired this character and how uh, Malcolm McDowell had played that role in uh, in the movie. And so, uh, who else but him could get the could get the call for uh, for Arcady Duval? And uh, obviously, the first of many. We've talked about Mr. McDowell several times on the show due to his role as Metallo later on but uh seeing here seeing here as as it is sometimes fun when we when we find the uh, the first appearance of one of our recurring voice actors here we have uh mr mcdowell and uh, as we talked about uh he's just perfect it's just this this slimy rich creep like he's just he's just he just thinks he's better than everyone and he's like you said he's you know i mean the first thing you see of him is him whipping the the factory workers and Dave Warner in a moment here, but him playing off of Raish, playing off of uh, Mr. McKinney as Jonah Hex. Uh, he's just there's just there's nothing redeemable about this guy. He's just he's just such a slime ball. He's slimy. He's like you want him to see him get his come come up in mm-hmm. like it's everything that a that a smarmy villain should be and uh i think that again that tells more of the uh, it's more of the stuff that they communicated without showing right so you don't mm-hmm. know specifically there's allusions to what he did but you don't know specifically uh what harm befell this woman that that uh that that Jonah Hex is after to to bring him to justice for but Everything that this guy character is characterized as explains that this is a guy that you want to see get his get his ass handed to him, right? Mm-hmm. You want to see justice served to this guy. He's mean to people. He's overly uh, he's overly brutal to the people that are working for him. He has seems to have no qualms with trying to boil a man alive. He's taking uh, he's taking quite enjoyment. Like the line where he says, "Let's see if we can make the other side match to Jonah yes. Hex as, as he hangs him over a boiling uh, cauldron of of hot liquid, like." This man, this guy is straight up evil. And then at the end, his the what like the the icing on the cake is once he's finally cornered and he's about to get justice served to him, he's cowering and throws money and begs, you know, here, take money, please. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and uh, you know clearly is is at the end of his rope, and suddenly when he doesn't have the the uh, the ability to to feel like he's this this uh, he doesn't have the advantage in the in the fight anymore, he's cowering, and the sniveling little little person that he is comes out. So yeah, uh, a great characterization. We already t- talked about the the dynamic between him and his 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 dad for the episode david mm-hmm. warner and the the bombastic boisterous uh you know delivery of all of his lines and the just the uh the the haughtiness that that's come and arrogance that come from uh the delivery that he gives every every line that he has uh, I, I mean unsurprisingly uh in, in a, a tremendous voice actor and uh, as we talked about uh, laying the groundwork for w- what would be a, a a defining role for this series uh in Metallo later on but uh interestingly i didn't struggle with the oh this is Metallo uh characterization with his voice for some reason that's usually something that i struggle with we've talked about that 
countless times when somebody plays dual roles or, you know, plays a certain role, but comes back later on to do a different role. I didn't, I didn't quite listen to this and hear, Oh, that's Metallo every single time that Mm -hmm. he spoke other than recognizing, Oh, okay. That's Mr. McDowell clearly. So um, I think that also adds something to it. So uh, yeah, I, I really enjoy this performance. And I think that, uh, character, you know, if you would, if you would, you know, uh, cast somebody else in that role, I, you, you wouldn't want to see the the justice brought to him quite as much. Absolutely, yes. The there's, yeah, there's just nothing redeemable about this guy. He's, uh, and uh, and yeah, Mr. McDowell plays him so well, and that's a great point too. We talk about that all the time when we when we find one of our iconic voice actors in a in a different role. Sometimes it can be distracting. It can be uh, it can take you out of it. The fact that he's able to, even though it's still, as you said, still very clearly Malcolm McDowell, uh, you know, his voice, but uh, it's just there's not. Uh, yeah, it doesn't feel like the same character at all, which is just, again, a credit to, to him as an actor and to, of course, to Andrea Romano as the voice uh, director. And uh, then, yeah, our uh, our main three to talk about here, other than Mr. Hex, uh, we have uh, we have David Warner, as mentioned, as uh, Ra's al Ghul. Ends up being his swan song for this original Batman the Animated Series. Um, obviously, he does pop up a few more times in the episodes we've yet to cover for obvious reasons. Uh, but, uh, man, he's, uh, he's great in the flashback sequences that we've just talked about with Malcolm McDowell. And then as I, I talked to, I was so, uh, drawn in by that, that final scene, uh, you know, at the airport with, with him talking to Batman and, you know, he, there's, there's a little bit of humor when he's, you know, when he says like, you know, it, did you really think in, in 600 years, I'd only sired one kid like, and, like he's something sort of a this sort of wit to, wit about him, and and then there's uh, you know, that that just very completely. It's not there's no there's no chest thumping. There's no there's no you know secret plot behind the words when he just says you know let me let me take my boy and go home. Like there's mm-hmm. he's so so brilliant. Um, is Mister Warner in this episode? I was just really struck. It it really almost kind of uh, obviously Mr. Warner has passed away uh, within the last year. It's it's uh, but uh, man, I was just really struck by uh, again, an actor who is not, is certainly better known for either his work on the stage or his work in front of the camera. But my, my, my goodness, he was just born to play Ray Shalko. I'm sure we've sung his praises every other time we've gotten to talk about him as well, but this maybe being his, his last episode of the original series, you're like, gosh, I could have done, could have done like 10 more episodes of, of Rachel Gould showing up just to hear, hear more, uh, more chances for David Warner to play him. It's really a shame that we didn't get a justice league race. Episode, yeah. I feel like that's uh, I feel like there's money left on the table, so to speak with mm-hmm. that, uh, with that one. You know, I, uh, I think we talked about when we reviewed it, he was supposed to be in wake the dead, I believe, but uh was uh was that that's one of the few i i know uh just people that worked on jlu have kind of said that the the whole bat embargo was a bit overblown by fans as to who they were and were not allowed to use but uh with Raish being a a member of the cast of uh of batman begins he was uh he was deemed off limits in that era so mm-hmm. yeah we missed out on at least one more appearance by mr warner in all likelihood <laughs> Yeah, but to your point, I think that that final that final scene, there's such a roller coaster sort of a, of emotion that he has to explain. You know, he's he's trying he he is trying to, and successfully, I think you one one could argue that he manipulates Batman into letting him go. He he his sweet talking and the way that he characterizes this i'm just a poor dad with my son and i just want to spend these final few you know wh- however many years he has left let me be like he's able to convince batman who's this uh you know who's this staunch man of justice he's he's jonah hex in this story and he lets him go he lets the bad guy go albeit for different reasons obviously but he Raish manages to outsmart batman to use his son as an emotional tool to let to have batman let him go so this roller coaster that he has to give of uh you know he talks about how uh how duval is 
a, a was too unbalanced and cruel. And you can feel the disappointment in the, the characterization that he gives of that, his son in that moment, you know, even as he realized he was too unbalanced and cruel, you know, that he, he wouldn't be able to succeed me in my, in my mission. Like you can feel the disappointment that he has in Arcady in that moment. Like, you know, this was the guy that I set up, but he was, he was a loose cannon that wouldn't just, be cool <laughs> you know and he's he's communicating that disappointment Absolutely. of that character and then he comes over to the but then he comes to the next point where he we get the reveal of him you know that this is his son and he he has the compassionate moment of you know what father could could ever forget his son and you get this really sad sappy moment where you almost feel like is race like a is he compassionate? Does Batman does Batman need to empathize with Raish in this moment? Which is hilarious because we know the the manipulation that that he's already done in his re- using Talia, his own daughter, to to manipulate Batman and attempt to to placate or to play into Batman's emotions and sympathy and and compassion. And then we know later on the type of craziness that happens eventually in Batman Beyond. Uh, so yeah, Raish is a master manipulator, and I feel like this scene is a very subtle way of revealing well, that type of manipulation that he's able to do with just a verbal, com- you know, with his his verbal his verbal speak, his conversational skills. So, Mister Warner had to communicate all of that sort of subtext and the emotion and the, you know, the the sad the sadness of this moment of the realization mm-hmm. that his son is dying, even though he didn't care for his son yeah. you know he let his son rot for in with hard in hard labor for 50 years um you know so it, but this is really just another key and an excuse to get let batman let him go so uh all of that comes out in that performance i think for mr warner i think in the scenes that we get during the flashback are great also his frustration with arcady uh we talked about it with kevin his uh at least I don't know if you can call it compassion in that sense, but his willingness to try and spare human life to warn people to get out of his way. Like you're either with me or against me, get out of my way. I'm going to destroy all these buildings. So everybody get out. Like you stay here at your own peril. He says, so uh, all of that is fun stuff. Uh, a wonderful performance from Mr. Warner and not, not surprising, you know, based on everything we know about his, uh, his uh his past performances Uh, this is another one where maybe he took the back seat for or he he was more of a supporting player in this uh this episode as opposed to his other appearances but still a a really fun appearance from absolutely absolutely can't uh can't say enough good things and yeah wrapping up we of course have oh who's left just our our regular dynamic duo lauren lester as robin doesn't get much to do here but uh nor does kevin conroy as batman because as we've been talking about for the last hour or so uh there's uh there's not a lot of batman and robin in this episode uh, across our, our 22 minutes or 21 minutes as we as we found out a little extra time cut off due to it being a, a saturday morning airing but uh yeah, uh, still, still solid job from our our dynamic duo, as one might expect, and uh, that will lead us towards, I guess, our scores here. So, um, everything. Uh, Sorry, but- I will. I will mention one thing. Mm-hmm. Batman, as you mentioned, doesn't get a whole lot, but I did love the line where uh, where right at the beginning, Raish is uh, walking through the old folks' home. And uh, he mentions that uh, the the people they, they don't have to worry about the attendants in the in the uh, old folks home that they'll be asleep for hours. But then you get this voiceover of of Batman saying, but I won't. And then he swoops in to fight the League of Shadows. So, I, again, yes. not a ton for right. Batman to do here. Uh, but I did love that line. That was uh, <laughs> that was a classic. You know, you could see that in a, a comic book panel and it was delivered with uh, with expertise, unsurprisingly, by uh, the, the late great Kevin Conroy. Absolutely, absolutely. Maximizing your minutes, I believe that's called, uh, mm-hmm. as Mr. Conroy does there. Um, so for all the reasons we've just been heaping praise upon this voice cast, I really didn't feel like I could give it anything but a perfect 10 out of 10 uh, for my voice act. Like I said, I, lo- I love the understated cowboy, you know, playing playing like a cowboy in an Old West uh, picture. I-, I love that for Mr. McKinney. And then uh, uh, Malcolm McDowell and David Warner as our our villains of of this piece just uh just outstanding just absolutely outstanding um so 
didn't really feel like I had a choice but to give it the perfect score this time. There you go. Um, and I gave the same exact score, a perfect 10 out of 10. Uh, agree wholeheartedly with everything. We just heaped a bunch of praise on everybody and said how great they were. So I don't, I don't know if uh, we could, we could go, uh, go any further with, uh, with, without giving 10. So yeah, I wholeheartedly agree with that worthy of high scores for both of us. All right, Liam, let's total up. Oh, that is the bonus oh. point sound. There I haven't we... heard that in a while. I thought it was broken. That's right. It's been a, been a while, but uh, bonus point sound there, which of course means that uh, one of us has a bonus point, and uh, it is me. It is I that have the bonus point. So, uh, Liam, I'm just going to award this. Uh, we already touched on it briefly. We don't have to go in depth, but I love the out of the box. We're going to pitch a... 19 minutes of a 21 minute episode mm-hmm. not featuring batman and featuring this hero that uh probably a lot of network executives had never heard of or thought about before and we're going to tell <laughs> this story and we're going to have fun and we're going to give all these homages to uh old western but not make it a straight up uh you know remember this type of episode uh it's influenced by but uh but we're not just going to do flashbacks to uh to old you know uh Absolutely. live action westerns here so uh i love all of that uh and uh as we mentioned at the top talking with kevin uh the wild wild west was an influence and that of course so near and dear oh. to both of us uh i love that that's something that uh played a direct role in inspiring this uh this uh this episode so uh a half a point for each of those those reasons out of the box why why <laughs> west uh, make a single extra bonus point here so yeah and this this isn't a bonus point but if we didn't mention it that title card uh oh, outstanding so um so just the, cal of course made a made a great uh great thumbnail for our for our episode this week based on it uh but yes, just the uh, it's it's so simple. It's you know just the the red circle on the black background and the the two saloon doors in there. Just just picture perfect and uh, yep. s- sets the mood immediately. So great uh, okay. great stuff there. If we didn't mention it, good point. All right, Liam. Well, let's total up our final scores and adding everything up, including my extra bonus point. I end up with a very strong thirty four out of forty for this week's episode. What about you? That's right. So, uh, yeah, and I also ended up with a the exact same final score of thirty four <laughs> out of forty. I thought we were going to be a little different this week, but the uh, the bonus point uh, assured that we are in full agreement again uh, this week here. But uh, as we talk about rewatchability, it's funny because this episode technically is very much a one off. Um, <laughs> it does have a returning villain. Mm-hmm. And as we we t- chatted about, Jonah Hex returns, but it's a younger Jonah Hex. In a... there's no references that we're aware of, right? I right. I don't. I don't even think Bruce Wayne doesn't even like acknowledge that he's heard of Jonah Fe- Jonah Hex in that episode, despite them interacting. So, um, so it's hard to say. Like you have to watch this. Like it's so integral to the DCAU. You have to watch it, or even that it's that integral to you know to this series or to the Rachel Ghoul character or any of that. But I can't bring my heart to say that it's a skip in any way because it's just so darn fun and so out of the box. I feel like this gets a thumbs up as we've just spent, you know, the last hour or so talking, just the the complete out of the box nature of it. It's so Mm -hmm. unique. Mm -hmm. I think it's even though it's not a, you know, it's not a, a, a plot driven, you know, it's not an episode that drives the overall plot of the series or the universe or whatever but it's so unique. There is no episode like this really. There is, there is no other episode like this in the DCAU. Uh, like we, you know, we see allusions to the old West or we might see a cowboy aesthetic pop up here and there, you know, vigilantes and justice league unlimited and whatever, but there's nothing like this episode anywhere else in the dcau so i think for that reason alone you you gotta watch watch or rewatch as we say it's it's about rewatchability uh i think you gotta watch this one yeah i i i would agree i think it at least gets one thumb up um rachel ghoul i think you could argue it's a two thumb upper because Mm -hmm. as you mentioned you could miss this episode and it wouldn't affect rachel's next appearance but it does create an interesting dynamic i think for Raish. it adds a little bit more to the story uh of who he is again i think it's sneakily a a 
a showcase in his ability to manipulate people <laughs> um, yeah. through through dialogue, through his storytelling and all of that. But uh, regardless, yeah, I, I, I would recommend this. I would say if somebody's saying, hey, for this this last little run of episodes, I would I would certainly recommend this over um i don't know uh the terrible trio like i'd rec i we already talked about that episode that's probably a bad example i would rec i would recommend this over i think i would recommend this over last week's episode like hey yeah. i only have 22 minutes which one should i watch watch showdown it's 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 interesting it's different um especially if you're looking for just fun 22 minutes of fun also so yeah i I, I'm going to step out of the box just like this episode did. And I'll give two thumbs up for this one also, as far as rewatchability is concerned. Uh, totally, totally agree there. All right, Liam, let's begin to wrap things up. Thank you once again to our special guest correspondent, Kevin Altieri, for donating his time this week and coming on the program and chatting with us. Uh, as we mentioned, always good to have him on the podcast. Don't forget, if you would like to support the podcast, there are multiple ways to do so. We'll discuss a few of those right now. First and most popular is leaving a five-star review uh, on your favorite podcast app. We are on Apple and Spotify and all the other ancillary podcast apps that pick up our feed, but uh, Apple and Spotify are the most popular, it seems, these days. Uh, and Apple allows you to leave a little blurb about uh, the podcast when you leave a review. So if you do leave a review on Apple, uh, we and we... We uh, we're checking those reviews every single week. There was not a new one this week mm -hmm. at the time of recording. Uh, so no uh, no gift ski to give away this week. But uh, if you do leave a five star review and a little blurb about what you like about the podcast and you live within the continental United States, we have a little thank you gift to send out to you. Uh, so uh, if if that's you, if you haven't left a review before, stop what you're doing right now and leave a review. If you have left a review before, guess what? You're still eligible. You can leave multiple reviews for the same podcast. I don't know why that's a thing, but you can do that. So <laughs> leave another one and we'll send you another gift. If we've already gotten one, or even if you've done it a couple of years ago, you can leave another review later on. So uh, certainly do so. You can also interact if you're listening on Spotify with our poll of the week and our question of the week. Those are Spotify exclusives as a Spotify podcast. Liam, folks can also support us by following us on social media at DCAU Review, both on Instagram and Twitter. As we mentioned uh, when we were talking with Kevin, follow him at Altieri Arts. Uh, slide into his DMs and get a commission if you're in the market for something uh, from one of the uh, the 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 cr creators of this amazing series. So uh, if you're looking for some artwork and you know, you're looking to get something commissioned, uh, Kevin did mention his uh, his his uh, commissions are open. So get in contact with him if that's something you're interested in. Don't forget also uh, you can support the our podcast directly. If you want to check out the show notes, there is a direct link to support us financially by myself and Liam. A a cup of coffee, something to keep us awake when we are uh, trying to come up with ideas for things to podcast about or uh, or just <laughs> editing the podcast, as Liam mentioned in the past. That always helps. So uh, you can also get a piece of merchandise from our shop. That link is also in the show notes. Check that out. I'm sure there's going to be lots of Black Friday sales coming up here in the not too distant future. Liam, speaking of Black Friday, next week here in America is going to be the Thanksgiving holiday. So we're giving ourselves good old-fashioned holiday from our standard fair here on the podcast. So no new standard episode this week. But guess what? It's the season of giving. So that means we're still going to have a podcast next week. We're not leaving people empty-handed. In fact, we might even be so generous as to give two podcasts <laughs> in a single weekend. Who... Who could even fathom such an idea? Let's chat about what we'll be doing next weekend rather than dropping our standard fare here as we take a break from our DCAU content for the next week. That's right. So uh, first and foremost, we will have our now yearly tradition, which is we drop a bonus episode every Black Friday, and we try to make it uh, somewhat themed to the the occasion, the shopping hall, the biggest shopping holiday of the year. Uh, and uh, this year, I think we'll be focusing on, uh, you know, as we've been talking about here and there, the uh, the DC Direct slash DC Collectibles Batman the Animated Series line. 
has been somewhat resurrected by uh, by McFarlane as they now have the DC license. And not only are we getting repaints and reissues of some of the older figures, but we're even getting new figures like the Condiment King build a figure which recently came out so with that uh with that in mind with hope once again on the horizon for new uh dc direct batman the animated series figures we thought we would uh we would send uh santa todd our our wish list (laughs) for characters from uh from batman the animated series and the new batman adventures that we would we would just love to see in this line before all is said and done and that uh that will be our Black Friday bonus. And then, as you mentioned, Cal, it's been a long time coming. Uh, we alluded to it on Twitter and I think other places. We always promised that we were going to do it. We didn't really know when. But we do still owe all of our listeners a review of the final issue of Batman The Adventures Continues Season 3. Speaking of Rachel Ghul, uh, and uh, and we might, we're going to try to get that recorded uh, next week and, and drop that probably some other part over, over either Saturday or some, sometime that weekend we're going to drop it. I don't want to commit us to any hard, hard dates with the holidays. People are hard to say goodbye to Batman. The adventures continue. We don't want to do it. That's why we've been putting it off. It's true. Uh, Yeah. We were, uh, we weren't quite ready to say goodbye, but we're going to try to get that done and try to get that put out sometime over that weekend as well. So at least one, but hopefully two bonus episodes coming out at, at you next weekend to uh, to make up for the fact that we are taking a week off from our regular reviews. So we're taking forward. a week off to give we're two <laughs> bonus episodes. We're working twice as hard despite not doing our regular episode. But uh, <laughs> hey, but well, hopefully if if we're not too verbose. The two bonus episodes will about equal the runtime of one of our regular episodes. That's what I'm hoping for. <laughs> That's right. Uh, by the way, spoiler alert, I'm putting Rachel Ghoul and Spats on one of my <laughs> I might change oh. it before. I might change it before then. But that's that's in the consideration. All Rachel right. Ghoul, Top Hat and Monocle. Removable monocle. That's that's on the list of, of once from Top. But we'll see. Can't wait to drop those episodes, Liam, as we come up here. We're very exciting holiday week here in the States. But until then, I'm Cal. And I'm Liam. And we will talk to you on the next bonus episodes of the DCAU Review. Bye-bye. Merry Thanksgiving.